So what I want to do is, uh, I was planning to read initially this text. It's called Autonomy and Academic Freedom. And this text was produced in, as a response to a questionnaire, which one of our students, Anton, has, um, has put together. Uh, a, a questionnaire, excuse me, for an anthology that one of our students has put together. And, um, and, and as, a, as a questionnaire answer, it's, it's a little bit compact, but nevertheless, it's, it's not uh, too dense. But as I was reading this and trying to remember what the hell I was talking about when I wrote it, um, I, uh, I remembered another text that uh, was in the back of my mind as I was writing it. And I went to look at it and I thought, oh, well, they might enjoy that. Um, so I want to read a few pages of a text that I presented um, some years ago. Actually, it's published. But um, the first five pages might give you a little feel for what it is I'm going to talk about in my um, questionnaire response. So this um, essay is, um, is entitled, A Pedagogy on the Verge of Disaster. And, and this was for a conference that was put together by Vincent van Gavin Oe, uh, with other members of a, of a journal that, um, that was produced through, through the EGS, through EGS students. Um, this was done in Albania, uh, and it was, uh, it was a quite interesting conference. Disaster, I took, uh, for those of you who know my work at all and know what my inclinations are, I took disaster in a Blanchotian sense. But, of course, I was also thinking about the situation in the contemporary university um, in Europe, and, and certainly in, uh, in Europe, first of all, but also in, in, in North America. And I started it with this um, little um, citation from Paul Ceylon in his Bremen address. It's one that's very important to me. I come back to it all the time. He, he, it's a little um, address that he, he gave when he received um, a, a prize. And he concludes, um, he talks about, he alludes to technology, he alludes to the, the, the role of poetry. And he concludes with these words, or very near the conclusion, says the following. I also believe that this kind of thinking accompanies not only my own efforts as a poet, but those of other, younger poets. Efforts of those who, with man-made stars flying overhead, unsheltered even by the traditional tent of the sky, exposed in an unsuspected, terrifying way, carry their existence into language, racked by reality and in search of it. I love that last phrase. They carry their existence into language, racked by reality and in search of it. I think Jean-François Léotard talk, Jean is talking about something like this in, <coughs> in an essay entitled Endurance in the Profession. So I'm going to take up with a brief, a, few, a brief discussion of that essay, which is, I think, quite extraordinary. So the phrase directing um, my reflections uh, on this, on this, at this moment, talking about the pedagogy of disaster, leads me back to a text that has haunted all of my reflections on pedagogy and university over some 20 years. I refer to a brief essay by Jean-François Lyotard that was first published in Critique in 1978 under the title Endurance and the Profession. It is an enigmatic text, if only for the fact that what is named endurance goes entirely undefined in what is, on its face, a rather dark and despairing reflection, almost as though endurance stands in lieu of that for which it might serve, but which cannot be named. Some hope, for example. I remain astonished and intrigued by this essay, but I believe I may now understand something of why it has so haunted me, so I would like to take my orientation from it. Whether or not I am correct in my intuitions, I can at least offer it as an exceptionally intriguing example of what we might want to consider a pedagogy of disaster, or at least an example of what might be a step towards such a thing. The disaster to which this text speaks first figures at an institutional level. The desiccating forces that have brought the severe conditions we know today were already clearly in ascendancy in the decade after 1968. And this, I think, is a very important point. What's, what's happening to us today in the contemporary university is, is hardly new. It's an unfolding of processes which were described very precisely in the late 60s and 70s in, by, by several of them, Lyotard among them. He says the following in the first line. It has become an enviable rarity these, rarity these days to obtain a salary in exchange for the kind of discourse that is commonly called philosophy. As the 20th century draws to a close, the statesmen and families who run the French secondary school system 
seem to want to have nothing to do with it. For according to the spirit of the times, which is theirs, to do is to produce, that is to reproduce with a surplus value. Those who teach philosophy are thus condemned to decimation or worse, while those who have studied it remain unemployed or give themselves up as hostages to other professions. Lyotard at this time had not hesitated to cast his lot with those who occupied the most extreme edge of the spreading disaster, namely the philosophy group at Vincennes, which by the time of Jean-François's account of his experience there had lost its right to grant degrees. This, I, I should pause for one second. I had a conversation with Alain Badieu at the moment when we acquired our accreditation, and he took me aside and said, Chris, you must be very careful about getting accreditation. <clears throat> he was referring to this situation of Vincennes. He, he personally was against taking Vincennes into a more institutionalized structure. Um, and, uh, and he said, you must be very careful about la normalisation. And I said, Alain, we are already normalized um, and you may not know this, but we have accreditation. It's just it's a bad one. <laughs> so, yeah. And then we went on from there. But anyway, the, the, but for Alain Badieu, the EGS represented a university sans titre and sans condition. In fact, it did have titre, but nevertheless, it, this is sort of the idea of university that reigned um, for many minutes at EGS. So here was a university almost sans titre and sans condition, and yet the students came. The want of conditions the lack of any formal justification or required structure, the utterly minimal state support, together with the strange persistence of the students, prompted in Lyotin a radical questioning regarding his pedagogical stance. In this situation of radical freedom and radical destitution, he was effectively disappropriated of any pre-given or institutionally sanctioned professorial authority. An imagined interlocutor queries him as to what this might mean. Does that mean that each teacher in your department speaks of what he or she want, likes? His answer, no, it means that no one is protected, and above all in her, his or her own eyes, by prescribed rules. And everyone must give his or her name to what he or she says, without pleading necessity. And everyone, like a stutterer, must head towards what he or she wants in order to say it. A very radical description of academic freedom, if you will. No one is protected, above all in his or her own eyes, her own eyes by prescribed rules, and everyone must give his or her name to what he or she says. The answer comes, you're exaggerating. He responds, don't forget, they wait for you every week and without telling you what they're expecting. All the same, you know what you're driving at. But no, Leotin explains, he does not know. What has motivated him is something less than an idea, something more like an impulsion, he says, a strength or a weakness that has led him to undertake meticulous examinations of ancient rhetoric, such as the machinery of an antistrephon put in the mouth of Protagoras by Diogenes Laertes. The interlocutor, interlocutor is incredulous. But yet you too want something. He responds, when younger, you might have wanted to plead, or to help, or to lead by argument or revelation. Now it's all over. You no longer know exactly what's wanted. How can you make others understand what you haven't really understood? But when the course works out well, you also know that since you made them understand what you didn't, it didn't really work out. <laughs> the anguish when you enter the classroom, especially at the beginning of the year, is not the stage fright of the actor or the orator, although it can be, the feeling of claustrophobia, all of us are going to burn in here, or the predicament of not knowing everything, which is rather reassuring. It is rather the sovereign pressure of an imbecilic you must go there, il faut y aller, which does not say where. The dominant affect then is anguish, and the impulse comes to be phrased in an insistent but obscure imperative. I repeat, il faut y aller, the e there, utterly undefined. The situation is not without its absurdity, which Lyotard illustrates with an anecdote I know he loves. Just two years ago, this or that leftist commando was bursting in, denouncing the magisterial function, the star system, alienation, apathy, cutting the electricity, raising his clubs, locking up the teacher a while, and abusing the students. To ponder a metalepsis in the narration of Book Nine of the Laws is not futile, it's criminal. They know where to go. We used to fight a bit. Only once did it lead to something worthwhile. And here he goes on to describe how his group, his, his study group, in the course of a strike at Vincennes, took to studying the rhetoric of the language employed in the strike. 
Confronted by the militants, it was possible for them to demonstrate that this group study, that their work was not in fact distinguishable, subtracting a reflective turn or two, from the kind of work or activity enjoined by the strikers themselves. The militants, shaking their heads, let them be. Now, it might be suggested that Lyotard illustrates with this story something not unrelated to the play of an antistrophon which, as he will later tell us, he might once have taken as a valuable political maneuver. I'll return to this point because it's crucial for understanding the curiously apolitical stance that Lyotard describes, its strange evocation of a certain futility, even a melancholic neutrality that some, and certainly the strikers, might find offensively academic. But I want to continue first with Lyotard's account of the pedagogical experience, experience which is suffused with anxiety. He goes on, the rhythm of work in progress seems tentative and peaceful, but on the occasion of each of these pointless classes, it becomes asceticism, impatience, and fear. You get up well before dawn and tell yourself, this particular part of the current work has to be done for tonight. For example, express the temporal logic of Protagoras's antistrephon before midnight, because the day after tomorrow, you must explain it to those who are waiting for you by looking straight at them and not at your notes. And as you aren't protected by an institution, make them furthermore understand that it's opportune or bearable to speak about such things. End quote. I emphasize that he feels he must assume the argument to the point of being able to communicate it without evasion, without the appeal to notes. Again, this is a situation of exposure. And he must be capable of communicating how this exercise can be justified. The outward honesty of this effort by which I mean the unguarded character of the address and the effort to legitimate without pre-existing legitimation, is then matched, he goes on to say, by an equal demand on the self. One must undertake the work without relying on received commentary and in such a way that one will be transformed by it. Underscore that, transformed by it. Lyotard is talking I repeat, about the analysis of an anti strephon attributed to Protagoras or some other, and yet he treats this as a form of experience, even a trial of sorts. The life of the mind is a peculiar thing and will never cease to astonish. Yet I believe we all know something of what he has evoked here, namely the experience of a passage in thought that has somehow changed the state of one's intellectual being. Our condition as teachers is a modest one, but if and when we teach, if we truly teach, our manner of occupying our world shifts. We experience a displacement of horizons. We imagine frequently enough that our teaching is changing the world, to the great amusement of even those who live near us. And we have. Or let us say that we have touched and thereby subtly altered the worldhood of our world for ourselves, and in some measure for those who have accompanied us. Nothing has changed, at least visibly, and yet everything, in a brief passage, has changed and is left with the self-effacing mark of this indemonstrable shift, this brief brush against what we might want to call disaster. Miyatar won't say this, but I believe we touch here on one of the keys to endurance, and we have a little hint of what it means to go there. Of course, all of this is undertaken in the most extreme doubt. He's talking to himself. You aren't cut out for thinking. You're a philosopher. You believe it's not natural to think. You're envious of, but after all, you disdain your colleagues and friends who work in the human sciences, who seem to be in symbiosis with their work, who have a corpus, a method, a, a bibliography, a strategy, exchanges. That's what makes you different, even from those close to you, like historians of philosophy, whom you admire nonetheless. You like what is unfinished. Nothing of what you write will be authoritative. You lend yourself willingly to this prescription, to go there without knowing where. You're certain that nobody can do it, least of all yourself. You know you're doing what you're not cut out to do. You're an imposter. You hate all this. Little by little, you cease to draw any vanity from it. And what is all this? Again, I underscore that he was studying rhetorical operators in the most fastidious manner possible. Fastidious and sometimes tedious because he was undoing every assumption that might be based on his prior position in Parisian intellectual circles or on expectations regarding the meaning of practicing philosophy at Vincennes in the, copy, in the company of figures such as Gilles Deleuze. 
He was undermining every position and every posture that might be attributed to him on this stage, refusing to declare what should be thought in the current conjuncture, as would a maître à penser, and refusing to pronounce on what can't be thought, as would a maître à penser. He would leave to others, he said, the task of naming the unnameable, saying the unsayable, conceiving the unconceivable, pronouncing the unpronounceable, or deciding the undecidable. Today, we might add, teaching the disaster. His task was without such commitments and obeyed a different form of exigency. So what was he doing? Why did he imagine that these rhetorical analyses could serve some honest end he declined to identify in anything but the most minimal fashion? On the penultimate page of his essay, he approaches an answer. You try for two kinds of understanding. First, that which permits you tomorrow to situate the antistrephon of Protagoras within the writing of a temporal logic. A strong understanding and ultimately useless. The other is totally different. To learn obscurely after months, years of study, why this bizarre verbal argument interested you. You first included it within a general examination of ruse, for example, and that had attracted you because you saw it as a weapon against the power. We're weak, you used to say as justification. All this seemed directed towards some political end. You were inspecting the available arsenal. The anti strafon found its place naturally in this general strategy, and you studied it as such. Now, two and a half years later, you confess the vanity of all of this. The anti strafon may well be a weapon at the disposal of the weak, it is also the strength of philosophical discourse, for this latter is made up of reflexive or speculative statements of which it is one type. Your general approach to paradoxes is modified by it, as are your politics. You say so. Your listeners, especially foreigners from poor countries, <coughs> believe that with this move you have lost even more pugnacity, that you have become even more of a product of that cold thought and refined style which they call French and which exasperates them. Lyotard was clearly not in a position to disabuse those foreigners. He had effectively displaced his relation to the political as such, offering, in the wake of what might loosely be termed a deconstruction of previously held assumptions about politics, a dubious nod toward philosophy, alleging that a political arrangement, dispositif, to which he had long had recourse, also belonged to the speculative resources of that practice. Going there had taken him to the limits of what he meant by politics, conceived as a form of agonistics, and back to a meeting with speculative thought, which may or may not have been in some way shaken by this exercise. Could this issue, this outcome, possibly serve some political exigency, presuming that what he was seeking there could even be said to be of a political order? Lyotard does not pause over this question. We are immediately presented instead with a further step in the atheological process of self-dispossession we have been following under the name of endurance in the profession. I'll, I'll conclude my review of Lyotard's essay with a citation of the last paragraph that presents a kind of leap prepared by his encounter with this unsettling meeting with philosophy at the limits of his political thought. I quote, the concessions to what you feel are expected to become rarer. You'd like to neglect even what your own mind desires, make it accessible to thought it doesn't expect. You don't read anymore to strip authors, but to steal away from yourself. You aim at, the de a de at this deculturation in every direction, science fiction, underground cinema, linguistics and singular logics, monsters of plastic and sound, surprising banalities, oblique rereading. Those of you who know his work from the 70s and 80s will recognize this, this movement. You are unfaithful in your alliances like the barbarians of Clastre, but for a different reason, opposite at least. You are at war with the institutions of your own mind and with your own identity. And you know that with all this, you're probably only perpetuating Western philosophy, its laborious libertinage and its obliging equanimity. At least you also know that the only chance or mischance to do so lies in setting philosophy beside itself or outside. I have referred to this process as one of dispossession. Lyotard describes it more graphically here as a form of internal war undertaken on the chance that he might thereby displace philosophy itself, which he had now understood to be the horizon of politics as he had practiced it to that point as a militant and as a philosopher. He won't say it in this essay, and perhaps he could not say it, but it is apparent from his later work that he was preparing his thought 
for the event. And uh, there I, I finish my commentary on Leotard and I should add a word about the event. His, uh, Leotard's um, work in, and this, this starts with, I guess it starts with Le Diffel, um, but then he will start speaking more openly about the notion of the event. His notion was that um, he was interested in, in a, let's say a structure of thought or a structure of experience because this involved what he called anamnesis, a, a recovery of one's own uh, exposure um, to, to, to alterity. <laughs> Uh, he was interested in the way in which thought could open to something radically new. And it required something like this deculturation, this dispossession that he was practicing and teaching. And that's why, as I will come to say in a few moments, he understood um, Bildung or pro professional formation or coming to, into education as actually a return to what is, in a sense, prior to Bildung. And, 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 and that would be the condition of opening to something radically new, some event, as he described. I hope that was intelligible. I, I tried to, I'm moving quickly because I want to read a bit more. Um, but I also I offered as a taster, to, as a, sort of an example of what it is I'm going to be talking about now as I refer more immediately to our, <coughs> excuse me, our situation. So, this is a questionnaire, and I need to read to you the questions that were posed to me. They are the following. There are three questions. Number one, a classical answer to the question, what is education, is often formulated in terms of its ideal purpose, namely that autonomy is the end that critical edu education strives for. But this answer prompts us to ask, what does autonomy mean as an educational ideal? So that's the first question about autonomy. And it's in relation to that question that I give the title of my, my essay, which is Autonomy and Academic Freedom. So what does autonomy mean as an educational ideal, um, if we had to accept the notion of autonomy? Two, the educational situation itself, insofar as it builds on a relation between students and an educational authority, raises questions toward the ideal of autonomy. How do autonomy and authority relate within education itself? And how, by which processes, is the autonomy of the individual even made possible through the relation to an authority? Classic question. How can we teach someone freedom or lead them toward autonomy? Third question. Autonomy is not only held as an internal ideal of education, classically the autonomy of the educational institutions has been held as a necessity in their external relations to society and politics. However, the nature of these relations poses recurring questions. How is education challenged by the contemporary demands of society and politics? Is it possible or sufficient still to maintain the idea of education as autonomy? So, question about the institution and the autonomy of the institution. And those of you who are you know, familiar with, certainly the education in the UK, for example, will know that uh, um, the autonomy is disappearing as, as, you know, as fast as possible. They are subjecting the university to what they call imperatives of social impact. All financing is, is directed to this, and um, the, the university is, you know, the autonomy is bleeding out of the, uh, of the institutional <coughs> structure. So, um, what does autonomy mean as an educational ideal? How do we think of autonomy as a relation between teachers and students? Or is that possible? And three, what about the autonomy of institutions? And those are the questions I, I seek to answer. I have to acknowledge from the outset that I will struggle with this term autonomy. It remains deeply at odds with the thought of human finitude. Freedom speaks to me much more immediately. And if we are to win terms back from the tradition in full cognizance of their destiny in modern metaphysics, I would prefer the latter word, freedom, given that it preserves the possibility of a relation to otherness that autonomy would seem to frustrate. Function functionality, that horrendous word, functionality perhaps names best the end of most education in the modern developed world. And this, sadly, is how we must answer the question, what is education today? 
it's a preparation of being functionally uh, 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 inscribed in, in, this, in the economic system. Resistance to this fate of the educated subject in the era, in the era of neoliberalism and technique is difficult to think, I believe, without reference to a notion of freedom, a value to which the term liberal and the phrase liberal arts must struggle more than ever to reach. But a notion of autonomy can perhaps also be brought forth that serves this latter notion of resistance. In any case, a notion of autonomy can be articulated that speaks to the highest ends envisioned in the speculative efforts of those who prepared the foundation of the University of Berlin. And while the philosophical assumptions and ambitions of these thinkers cannot be taken over without critical transformation, their understanding of academic freedom and what thought at the university might be mark an invaluable precedent. Those of you who are studying Hegel right now might, <laughs> might be thinking about this question. Hegel had things to offer there. Um, but of course I'm thinking of people like Humboldt and Schelling and uh, Schleiermacher and um, uh, other, other figures around the time who contributed to this effort to, to found a new university at the beginning of the 19th, uh, 19th century. So these, these figures set many of the terms of a struggle relating to education that might have seemed almost hopeless in Europe less than a year ago, and unfortunately only more difficult today in the midst of convulsions that may bring new restrictions to projects of critical thinking and other manifestations of freedom. This is not the occasion for returning to the text of these thinkers. I, I urge you to do it. It's fascinating reading, all, all of this uh, effort to rethink the, the meaning of the university. I can't return to that now, but I want to retain their inspiring reference, efforts excuse me, and a tradition of thinking that has proceeded from them as a point of reference for measuring the ever more essential character of the struggle against the educational processes that serve that grim term, functionality. So... One, teaching autonomy. Working then with a loose sense of the term autonomy, let me ask how, in higher education, we can endeavor to free an autonomous exercise of thought, be this in any field of research or creative practice. And let me begin by speaking from my own site, which is the European Graduate School, an effort to recover a meaning for the universe, European University that remains modest in actual resources, but is nonetheless commensurate, I believe, with the speculative endeavors of those who prepared its refoundation over two centuries ago. So, a big claim for our little institution, but why not? Let's go for it. <clears throat> I speak from this special site because I believe that new educational practices, practices serving the end I have defined must be won experimentally. I recall here the delightful thought experiment undertaken by Gérard Granel in De l'Université in 1982. It's a wonderful text. You should look at it if you're interested in these questions. So this thought experiment undertaken in 1982 and the playful fiction that Granel proposed, despairing of any effort at reform in the socio-economic socio context of the time. I remain in agreement with him regarding the profoundly limiting scope of the horizons of possibility offered by our modern socio-economic order, even if I disagree with him about the futility of struggling from within. And I am inclined to think that these horizons have not significantly broadened with the extraordinary technical developments now on offer. Accordingly, I am not sure that a practical design for a new university exists that can satisfy the idea of the university toward which I have gestured a university where the possibility of a free thought of a worldly character can be practiced or prepared. So to make that clear what I'm saying, um, I understand what we're doing as an experiment. And I don't think we can do anything more than an experiment in trying to rethink what a university is in the current socioeconomic horizon. Because the conditions of thinking such a thing are really quite limited, I believe. So we have to find ways of, of discovering, inventing new relations, new possibilities. And, and this is an experimental process, I believe. But it's worth doing, I think. And it's worth doing, and this is a key point for what we do, it's worth doing from within. And that's why I was willing to fight for accreditation. I want to be a, the European Graduate School. I, I want this, and I also want it for you, but I want it to be um, a, a, an institution that can intervene in the European situation in institutional terms. 
Clearly, a new university must be invented. But I am a bit more accepting of our finite condition, conditions than Granel, and a bit more open to the possibility of the event in education. From this ground, I remain devoted to a concrete form of experimentation guided by values such as academic freedom. I would also underscore that I accept Gérard Granel's argument that the exercise of thought in any given discipline of study must engage the existence of those who practice that discipline and must seek to draw forth the meaning of that practice for those practitioners and for a larger public at the level of their world. I'm using this term in a slightly Heideggerian sense, you'll forgive me for my own professional deformation, um, but I, you know, I, I can't dwell on that too long. So this latter term, world, can only mark a question at this juncture, but one that remains unavoidable, for it is perfectly obvious, I believe, and it has been so since the founding of the University of Berlin, that any question of profound social meaning requires some thought of the whole of social existence. We encounter this, for example, in the painful exigency of thinking today what a term such as refugee implies. Universities have increasingly surrendered to technocratic imperatives that reduce education to the preparation of expertise in a knowledge economy that requires discrete forms of professional specialization or more technical skills. But the resulting isolation of disciplines from one another, with the eclipse of the question of the whole to which I am pointing, condemns all of them to some degree of abstraction. Therefore, it becomes imperative to keep alive in higher education not only the question of the foundations of any given discipline, but also its relation to all other fields of inquiry in a university worthy of its name. One must therefore speak, seek, excuse me, in and through every discipline a question of the order of the one Maurice Blanchot posed for literary study. I give this example of literature in the university. Maurice Blanchot, this is the beginning of L'Entretien Infini, a little note, a beautiful little uh, statement, which was in 1969, as I remember. He asked, what does it mean that something like literature should exist? What does it mean that something like literature should exist? This is a question that leads to the imperative of broad cross-disciplinary study inquiry. It leads us into questions about language. It leads us into questions about um, the, the symbolic structure of a society. It leads quite far in, in its implications. So I repeat, this is a question that leads to the imperative of broad cross-disciplinary inquiry, even as it leads back to literary study by reason of the singular character of the literary event, forcing an acute form of disciplinary reflection. So it's not a matter of giving up you know, the, the question of literature, but it's a matter of thinking it in the, both in, a, in its singular, or that, what the singularity of the literature is, uh, and also in its relation to other uh, forms of, of inquiry. Without a questioning of this kind, this broad kind. On its horizon, once again, a discipline's study is prey to formalism and the hold of abstract jargon, however scientific in its formulation. It can only produce further abstraction. I saw it in a little book, The Claim of Language, to draw forth what this argument implies for the humanities inasmuch as they address and, dis and deploy distinctive uses of language opening by this means to concrete questions bearing on all dimensions of human existence, including a relation to the world that obliges us to entertain today notions of the post or the inhuman. I would argue that the individual who undertakes and undergoes such an engagement with language, which I think is peculiar to the humanities, effectively opens to a free exercise of thought. But I wonder if one passage of this kind from one disciplinary site, can ever really suffice for a concrete form of autonomy? And is the opening not always threatened by a disciplinary closure where the relay called for in exposure to limits of any discipline, when it touches on questions of fundamental and social meaning, is impeded if not blocked? In other words, I think that when you really go to the limits of a discipline and you, and you begin to understand the, 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 the limits, you know, it's, it's finite character, then you, you, you're, called to other, you're called to a relay into other disciplines. Right? And that's, it's that relay that, that is, I think, ultimately the most interesting. What's the structure of that relay? To rephrase what I have said thus far, every practice of thought 
calls for complementation of its efforts vis-a-vis -vis the exigencies of that thing to which the phrase res publica points, the real that lies at the horizon of every search for social meaning in a particular discursive mode. Thought knows in the always singular paths of this search the lure of a whole. And what inspired researcher does not sense that they have touched upon this whole when they achieve in their writing or presentation an experience of concreteness? But the self-reflective, and I, I'm just, I, I invite you to remember, every time you really get into your topic in a paper, you might start hearing echoes on what people are doing around you. I know, Julia, you've heard me talk about this before. You start to get this, you know, you, someone, you'll be in a bar and someone tells you what they're doing and you say, yeah, I, I've been working on precisely this question. In fact, you're not, you're not at all. But <laughs> in some sense, you are. Because you're talking about, you're, you're touching upon, the, if I speak very rapidly, the symbolic conditions of thinking a, a, a question in, in this moment in relation to your shared socio-economic or political context. So you are. You are touching on the totality. But maybe not as immediately as you think when you think your friend is generally just a secondary reflection of what you're doing. So, but the self-reflective researcher will also recognize in that same movement the inherently partial, or better, I would say, fragmentary character of that concreteness, and hence the requirement of the relay to which I have referred. Every striving for reality in thought must go to the limits of the path chosen and will inevitably disclose those limits, if it really does go toward the real. Is it not therefore imperative that a higher education reveal to the student multiple passages of a fundamental character? And in a time when mythic constructions of the whole are in resurgence, is this critical practice not all the more imperative? With this principle in view, I believe it is possible to affirm philosophically the choice of the European Graduate School in our division to construct a curriculum that is, in fact, without disciplinary bounds in the sense that it requires of its students work in a series of seminars that implicitly or explicitly entail a fundamental questioning of the fields taken up in them, there being no limit to the number of fields that might be broached within a course of study involving 12 seminars for each of the advanced degrees, MA and PhD. Every student, whatever their special field of expertise or professional background, and the EGS actively promotes diversity in this respect, must undertake this cross-disciplinary experience. It should be noted immediately that a very particular form of teaching is required for this form of curriculum, one that is inherently public. This is what I was saying briefly, I think, earlier today one that is inherently public in its address insofar as it cannot presuppose advanced preparation on the part of the students. And it can only rely on a profound interest and a willingness to attempt the course of study. That's why I was speaking of patience this morning. <laughs> Professors must effectively translate their thought in terms that are accessible to a diverse group, but in no way reductive with respect to the questioning undertaken. It is this challenge that seems to bring the distinguished faculty back to the EGS year after year, for their recasting of their thought in such exceptional circumstances is inevitably generative of new thinking, along with remarkable pedagogical encounters. And that's why I like to say, we are not just a research university in the sense of Humboldt, in the Humboldt University, we are um, a university that practices research and teaching. We, we do research and teaching. Uh, because there is this event that happens in the, in the exchange. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, there's something going on here, because these faculty are coming back year after year, and a few of them don't need the money. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, something going on, and this is what I'm trying to get at. Why? What is that? What is that? Of course, such a movement between disciplines implies that seminar training cannot be directed to the development of mastery in a particular area of research process that normally entails progression from introductory levels to more advanced ones. You'll have already noticed we're not doing introductions in, in the seminars, right? You're not getting, uh, you're getting some introduction, but this seminar is going pretty high, pretty fast. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm speaking of both Alenka and Miladin right now. Mastery will come once a chosen, field is a chosen field is defined and explored by the student in independent study. The supposition being that such learning does not require constant oversight, 
if advanced students are initially given the means to address the fundamentals of any discipline. The latter means, habits of inquiry sharpened by extensive exposure to philosophically informed theory and sustained questioning with respect to contemporary topics. These means are provided in the seminar training of the EGS, where seminar directors are leading proponents of their fields, individuals who in many cases have shaped the very fields they address in their seminar. What is crucial in this model, I emphasize, is not acquisition of a fund of knowledge. It's not about learning all the information in any particular field. We expect you to do that on your own. Right? But repeated passages in fundamental questioning to the limits of what any given discipline can offer with respect to some topic of inquiry. This course of study, when it is genuinely engaged, will foster a distinctive freedom in the student's approach to their own chosen field of research. A singular capacity to construct a problematic requiring cross-disciplinary inquiry and an ability to address that problematic with a special breadth and methodological sophistication. Let us call this a disciplinary reflexivity of a kind, though reflexivity does not quite capture, as I will try to show in addressing the second point raised by those who pose the questions, it does not quite capture the form of freedom involved, I think. Disciplines, I'm still in my first question, coming to a conclusion. Disciplines are resistant formations. They will always reassert their hold in some measure as a student strives to define the question that organizes their study and to support their argument in a scholarly manner. The structures by which disciplines reproduce themselves are powerfully constrained. And this can be affirmed even without consideration of the more coercive practices sometimes involved. Scholarly protocol in each field and in each national context is profoundly defining which means both enabling and limiting. And the constraints involved are easily hidden by institutional practices involving a distribution of rewards. The EGS recognizes the necessity of those defining elements of discipline. We don't issue disciplines altogether. And, and in fact, you know, there's a lot to be learned from gaining you know, a, a significant grasp of a disciplinary history. Um, and that's certainly true. Well, it's true of every discipline, it's certainly philosophy. So the EGS recognizes the necessity of those defining elements of discipline. It is wholly committed to academic standards in its work. But it is also seeking to impart a free relation to disciplinary constructions and a capacity for singular passages between them, not in a spirit of eclecticism, but for the purpose of addressing freely core dimensions of existence in the contemporary world. Exposure to theory in itself, I want to insist, does not bring the critical uh, freedom I have sought to describe. The explosion in theory of the last century has not brought a true explosion of disciplines, simply because disciplines can easily contain the purchase and philosophical impl implications of theoretical inquiry. The free use of philosophically informed theory of the kind we seek to advance at the EGS requires a constant passage beyond the limits of the disciplinary articulation of knowledge and the institutional mechanisms serving the containment of thought. The effort can only have limited impact in relation to the stultifying structures that largely define what teaching is today. But freedom, I believe, when exercised, has a way of propagating itself. It communicates itself, like laughter, let's say, <laughs> or other things. Second section, autonomy and authority. The pedagogy. I hope I'm not going on too long. I don't have a. Problem. I'll just carry on a bit. <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me. I don't have a clock. The pedagogy leading to the free exercise of thought described here would appear to require a form of mastery and an accompanying authority, and this is indeed the case in some measure, though only to a limited degree, as I want to try to show. And I, I won't be too much longer here. I'll just try to answer this question about autonomy and, and the relation between the master and the disciple, so to speak. Teaching that pursues the fundamental ambition to which I have referred, teaching that is not simply research-led but intrinsically a form of research in itself, must go beyond a mere imparting of knowledge, be this, be this an exposition of relevant <coughs> theory or the work of leading names in a field. However competent such exposition might be, you know, in terms of 
what's to be learned out there. It remains short of the form of thoughtful questioning to which students must be exposed if they are to learn what it is to think on their own, if they are to learn thinking. Yes, in an EGS seminar, there will inevitably be the communication, of, there will inevitably be communication of insight into the discursive grounds of the topic or problematic under consideration, the historical and philosophical grounds of whatever is being discussed. The experience of the master teacher is invaluable here, particularly if they are to address students who are not specialists in the field under consideration. It takes a certain amount of expertise to explain you know, fairly advanced stuff to people who are not already well involved in the field. This experience is also an important source of the authority the professor requires if they are to lead their students through a period in which many students must discover that they are not yet thinking with respect to the questioning undertaken in the seminar. It's just the way it is. That's why you're in the seminar. You want to learn how to think in the thing. But the teacher is, if the teacher is to lead into thinking or stimulate it anew, they must be prepared themselves to undertake a very intensive form of reflective engagement with text, image, or schema and develop this into a genuine question. This is why you will find in a lot of the seminar that the professors sit down and start reading text with you or reading images with you. And, um, and in that process, they are enacting their own effort to think or effort to question and to, and to uh, come to some discursive response to what it is they are reacting to in this, in this document. Again, a great deal of knowledge will be communicated in this process. There will also be imparted habits of questioning and a form of exposure that is always communicated with a singular stimmung a certain disposition of energy conveyed in a tonality and posture of question. Students, and we will all recall this, first learn from their most influential teachers gestures of thought in a mimetic exercise. They imitate. We will, we will all do that. But they will also witness, if they are truly following, and this speaks to the teacher's task as well, a seeding of mastery, a giving up, a surrender of mastery. A surrender occurs, in fact, when the professor explores the limits of their grasp of the thing that holds their attention. Jean-François Lietard described the surrender at numerous points in his work on the teaching relation by argu arguing that a philosophically informed questioning in any field will, dem will demand a form of re-beginning and a self-exposure that is more than reminiscent of infancy in that it rejoins a native capacity for openness. Lyotar was seeking a pedagogy that might prepare for what he termed the event. And I would argue that what I have called a free use of thought is free in part by reason of its capacity in this regard, an openness to the event. It's a strange form of capacity, to be sure, but nonetheless something for which one strives. The true master is therefore always at some point a little less than a master. And what they will teach us is in fact the autodidaxy that they perform in their effort to approach that place, where thought engages the thing of its concern, whatever the disciplinary site from which one starts. They will communicate their own searching act of thought, their own effort to begin to think. Se former au retour, Nietzsche writes. Prepare oneself to the return, or form oneself in relation to the return, or from the return, Nietzsche writes invoking a bildung that involves a form of dispossession or exposure, and thus the experience of the return of a form of infancy. In short, the master forms by inviting to a repetition of self-discovery in a philosophical course of study, as Miyatar puts it, that is of necess necessity an exposure to what one cannot master, namely the finitude of one's understanding, and an exposure to the possibility thereby of genuine engagement. Projecting toward the ends of such teaching, that is, again, beyond the immediate end of preparing students for independent research in an academic thesis, we can say that it takes on a profoundly ethico-political character to the extent that it involves preparing the student for a form of thinking performance that is perhaps the prerequisite of genuine democracy. <coughs> Excuse me. At least in the sense described by Jean-François Lyotard, when he argues that a republic must teach its citizens what it is to bring something other to the public space than a repetition of the same. It is ethico-political 
in the sense offered to us by Emmanuel Levinas in his meditations on the teaching that occurs in the relation with the human other, autrui, and it is inevitably political in the sense that prompting the self-formation of a subject capable of conceiving a free relation to the functionality to which they are summoned, and always in some measure with the other, has political meaning, however undefined. Again, there is a form of autonomy because this pedagogy requires of the students an act of translation by which the singular path of thought undertaken by the professor is appropriated in a new act of autodidaxy, wherein the student experiences otherness for themselves. A student will often, as I've said, will often mime the path undertaken by the professor for some time as they learn to translate the singular gesture of thought that they have encountered. But the pedagogy I sketch here ultimately requires a different form of repetition, a genuine re-beginning. And this requirement, I emphasize, will become all the more acute when a student undergoes, I think, a serial exposure to such an exercise of thought through a number of cross-disciplinary passages. In, every, in, in other words, every time you go through one of these seminars, you're going to have to find your bearings. And you're going to have to find your bearings, your bearings for yourself, in some measure for yourself. So this process is going to be repeated. Autonomy could perhaps name here the always singular search for the rule that will guide one's thought, both in the response to a teaching and in the effort to proceed independently in a research project. And yes, one undertakes this search in some measure alone, but always from the ground of a recalled exposure to the other, the teacher, and always an exposure to oneself by way of the anamnesis that occurs with the return to infancy in relearning what it means to speak meaningfully with respect to a given topic, a text, or a problematic. I, I don't know how long I've gone on. Um, I could stop right there. Um, it's 9.30. It's 9.30. Yeah. Let me stop. Um, I, didn't, I didn't want to go on too long. I, I have a little ex I, I, example of just how painful it can be to work in the contemporary <laughs> university writing research grants. <laughs> I'll, I'll spare you that. I don't want to depress you in the first night out. <laughs> um, thank you.